This is KHBR, the voice of darkness for the intrepid travelers of the left-hand path. I'm Magister Robert Adams, your host. We'll be accompanying you on your journey. So get ready, sit back, relax, and prepare to kefir and remanifest. Welcome to KHPR, the voice of darkness. I'm Magister Robert Adams, the host, and today we have the honor of speaking with Ipsissimus Don Webb, who is the former high priest of the Temple of Set and has written numerous books on what the temple does that are available to the public. Don, thank you for being on the show today. Well, thank you, Robert. I'm really glad to, that you invited me. Well, you know, I figured that this would be a good show to do because, you know, we've been talking in the interview I did with Dr. Aquino, um, you know, he talked about people working with the Setian current in the left-hand path who weren't members of the temple. And, I mean, you were really one of the first people to give them this information in your books that you've written. Well, I think that it's very important to be to be self-defining because the temple, because of our somewhat controversial nature, is often defined by misinformation. You know, you can go to any number of, of websites and discover all sorts of horrible things about us, such as that we're actually reptiles from uh, Sirius and so forth. And so, therefore, I wanted to have something that addressed the fact that we are a modern philosophical and magical organization that does probably not too kooky. Well, and, and I think you've done uh, a very good job with that. And uh, I think the time that you served as the high priest of the temple as well, you've really uh, managed to change a lot uh, within the organization and the way, uh, the way it is. Because I know it certainly today is not like it was when I first joined it. And just as the people within the temple kefir and remanifest, so has the temple uh, evolved and gone through its own bit of self-transformation over the years. Now let's talk a little bit about your books. Now, there are three in particular uh, that deal with what the temple does. And people always uh, ask me this question is, you know, which one should I read first? Now, I think the, okay. No, go ahead. I think the seven faces of darkness, uh, is, is a very good start, not because it deals particularly with the Temple of Set as an organization, but it deals with Setian philosophy both in its current manifestation and then also Setian philosophy in, in late antiquity as is revealed in the magical papyri. Now, not just because it's good to look at old things, but it's good to look at this from a non-Judeo-Christian point of view it's set up for the individual practitioner, both philosophically and operatively, so they can actually grab some of the spells, do some of the work, see if they have some talent and magic, as well as thinking about some of the, the ideas, sort of Neoplatonism, that the current temple has. After that, I would read um, the uh, Uncle Setnock's Essential Guide to the Left Hand Path. Um, Again, it's a very uh, basic book. It's a survey of left-hand path thought. Uh, it does have a chapter on the temple, but it's there for both people, setting thinkers within and beyond the temple, and will enable you to have vocabulary, to have concepts that are useful. Um, so I find it a very useful general guide. Uh, also, in the final book, of course, it would be Secret Teachings. Uh, the Secret Teachings book has some articles I wrote inside the temple, some articles I'd written for our internal organ, the Scroll of Sat, as well as just some topics that people have written me about and said, can you explain this? So, I, I, but actually in, in any order, although I would have chosen the order I just gave. Mm -hmm. Well, I always recommend Uncle Seknock's Essential Guide to the Left-Hand Path uh, as being good because it's um, it's written in a way that the average person 
can understand it more and they don't have to feel like uh, they're being, you know, flooded with ancient history sort of thing. It's, uh, it, it, it takes the SETI in practice um, and lays it out without a lot of the surroundings, um, the surrounding trappings, so to speak. And I really like that book. I mean, that's one of my favorites personally. But um, I, I think it's good that you've recommended uh, the order people should read the books. I always recommend to people that they get all of the books. And, uh, you know, they always, they always say thank you to me afterwards after they've read them. And usually a lot of them end up joining the temple because of them. Well, I have noticed, um, you know, certainly when I was high priest and, and just in occasional chats with our executive director, uh, a high number of people mentioned my books in their uh, letters of application. And probably the uh, probably the, the general applicant um, reflects your taste because I think actually Uncle Fetnox is mentioned more more readily. Um, I find that a lot of people that do the initiatory right in that book wind up joining later, and I like that because it gives them a chance to go out and you know try you know try it before you buy it approach to uh, magic and philosophy. Exactly. Now. When we were doing the, the episode on music and magic, we were talking about why we felt a need to express our, to use music to express ourselves in an initiatory context. So I would have to ask you, what gave you the feeling of a need to write these books for the public? Well, uh, I was very lucky in the way I joined the temple. Um, I was a personal friend of Dr. Stephen Flowers and had known him for years and observed and was able to talk with him about studying philosophy and observe it in his life. And I realized that the average person, the only glimpse of the temple they got was in our introductory letter. And the temple has... Um, a large amount of richness, and one of the things that distinguishes us from most other cult organizations, in fact, I think maybe all other cult organizations, is we're not just about the charismatic leader. It's not just about, oh, this is what Michael Quino did. Um, and I wanted to, to make that clear to people outside the temple that there's a lot of us that um, are fairly bright and fairly successful and have our own take on uh, left-hand path philosophy. Yeah, and I can definitely see that um, through the various shows that I've done. I mean, the responses I'm getting from people, uh, they really like the idea that I was able to interview Dr. Aquino, but also at the same time, the fact that it's not everything coming from Dr. Aquino, that we have this group of like-minded individuals that uh, we, we share, we, we learn by teaching and teach by learning sort of thing. And like when we have a conclave, um, the energy that's in the rooms when the people are together can be very incredible. And, uh, you know, we're always bouncing things off each other and playing around with things like that. Um, and as a matter of fact, you were just at the conclave that we had in your hometown of Austin. And I heard that went incredibly well. Uh, it did go well. We, you know, we had um, a large amount of the international membership was was present, and you know, people enjoyed the the laid back city. We have to have it at Halloween. Austin puts on a good uh, a good Halloween. Uh, uh, but one of the nice things about Conclave, as is generally known, our uh, predecessor organization, the Church of Satan. Um, was very much about the charismatic leadership of one man. Right. And um, Anton LaVey only allowed the Church of Satan to have one gathering and then became nervous of what's it going to be like for everybody's talking to each other. Whereas for Sedians, it's, uh, I would say, essential to their initiation to actually go and meet and speak and see how they succeed, how they have the same fears and problems, marvel at talents and magic, and see that it's a real group and not just uh, a lot of people with a web page or a Xerox machine. Right. 
And I, I think that is, is a great thing that we're able to have those every year. Um, now, you also, when you became the high priest, you did something that surprised a lot of people, is you also became a magus, but you mm -hmm. became the second magus of the word kefir. Now, for you, now Dr. Aquino told us what kefir meant for him. As the second magus of kefir, what did kefir mean to you? Well, first thing I'd like to point out is the reason that we occasionally use words from another language is not because the other language is more holy or more mysterious or more powerful. We use it for precision. In English, we have words that for being that are static, like I am, I exist. And we have words for becoming, I become, I change, I evolve. Uh, but we don't have a word that actually embraces both concepts. The Egyptian verb kefir, usually rendered into English as, I have come into being, embraces both being, a sense of eternal part of the cosmos forever, and becoming, a changing, evolving, self-refining. As a consequence, this word uh, encapsulates the Thetian philosophy uh, and it is also the word in Egyptian meaning dawn, because at the moment of kefir, the moment you realize that you're both eternal and changing, is the moment that the internal light will show you all the mysteries of yourself. So it sounds kind of like the difference between a noun and a verb is you were using it in a more active sense. That it's a well, it's you know, it's one of those things that doesn't quite fit into um, Indo-European uh, verb concepts. It's an old Egyptian static verb because the Egyptians had a had a category that wouldn't quite fit into our nouns or verbs. Interesting. I I I honestly have to say that I have not studied Egyptian. Um, I have studied the culture, but I've never gotten that deep into it. So that's very interesting. And I can see that because, uh, some of my friends within the temple who their main focus is on linguistics and how languages are developed, um, you know, have said that they're the whole noun verb, uh, that we think about doesn't apply to other languages. And there are some languages that may have only you know 25 different sounds but how you make each sound uh, is how you create your phrasing and your sentences uh, you know a, a sound uttered in several different ways means different words so uh, that's that's actually a very interesting topic uh, to cover well magic is a, is a process of communication you're either sending your desires either into some part of, of your, your own cosmos, into yourself, saying tomorrow I will be more awake or I'll be more healthy or whatever level of your own reality, or you're sending your desires into the cosmos, into some secret place that lets this happen, or you're receiving information from the cosmos in some form of divination. Now, again, because I was, you know, Dr. Fla was and I am Dr. Flower's friend, I had a lot of linguistics in my thinking. Uh, he, uh, his academic mentor, the late uh, Dr. Edgar Polame, was a tremendous linguist. Uh, and I would go to his lectures at the University of Texas and then also took classes from uh, one of his pupils, Dr. Mark Southern. So I'm very, systems of communication are very much part of the magical landscape. You know, we, we either want to, to tell the universe what to do or find out what it's hiding from us. Magic is a, is a desire to control the forces that regulate life. Yeah, I can see that. Now, going back to your books for a, a second, are there going to be any more that you're writing regarding the work of the temple that are going to be available? Uh, I don't know if I'm, I don't have any temple 
specific book that I am planning. Um, I am working on a Lovecraftian grimoire that uh, will probably see the light of day in the summer. And I expect at some point to write a book on Tetkatlipoca mm. and um, the, the Aztec trickster figure who is very similar to Sad. Yeah, I remember one working that was done by a pylon on Tezcatlipoca, and I was really mesmerized as you were walking around the room, and you were uh, reciting an incantation in Nahuatl, which was the first time I'd ever heard, I'd seen some words, but it's the first time I'd ever heard it spoken, and it was a very moving experience then um, it was like you had become another person at that time. And it was one of those things that you just, my describing it is, is not the same as actually being able to have experienced it. And I know a lot of people afterwards were talking about that, that working. And that was uh, one of the high points of that conclave actually. Well, the, uh, it's very interesting that you would, would describe the, um, the metamorphosis that can occur within the ritual chamber. In uh, our host culture, in Christianity, you know, we, we, they have the view that there's all these creatures out there waiting to get you. You know, this sort of Linda Blair moment soon to be followed by spewing the green vomit. Whereas in actual magic, you're revealing aspects of yourself that your everyday consciousness and everyday surroundings don't allow you to have, but human beings have tremendous creativity, tremendous forms in themselves. Even someone that you may talk, speak with in your day-to-day -day world that you think of as the dumbest person ever, ask them sometime about their dreams, and in the night they're able to come up with these entire landscapes, entire thoughts, and they're using, who knows, maybe, maybe one thousandth of themselves to do that. And of course in the ritual chamber, you can take that creative process, you put it under your conscious control, and you can bring it to a level that other people can actually see it. Um, and you're so right. The actual seeing of magic changes your perception of the world. You can read about books from now to eternity. You can try your own work and think, well, this may be a subjective impression. But group workings are a moment you, you realize other people have aspects to other realms and reality. And that's a secret that our society does not want us to know, that the church didn't want us to know, that is probably good that most people don't know because they couldn't handle that as part of their daily inventory. Yeah, I would totally agree with that because I know for myself, when I've planned a ritual, and sometimes I tend to plan rather complex ones, I'm like going through everything beforehand, like, oh, oh crap, okay, do I have this done? Do I have this ready? Do I, uh, is this person ready? Are we prepared here? And I'm stressing myself out, and then the second the bell starts ringing, it's like everything snaps into place. And I, I just become someone else, sort of. And I, I really believe it's sort of like, you know, at that point, it's almost like Set is sort of tapping me on the shoulder going, calm down you'll get it right and I always seem to do that and I noticed that with other people as well is um, you know maybe not the first group working they're in but after you've done a few you know you've you have changed yourself over time that gives you this ability to sort of work it when you need it well magic is now of course magic is not democratic you know, just as we can't all be in the NBA, we can't all be um, great magicians. People do have a certain amount of, of native talent. But the interesting thing about magic, it can be developed and refined like any other human art form. Because a place of creativity that is as valid as music or writing or sculpture or architecture. And it's only because of certain cultural accidents that magic did not become a part of mainstream European thinking. Yes, I, I can definitely see that. I know, you know, when you see a show about um, 
that's one of the swords and sorcery type of shows is you know a culture that would have that happening would probably have so much corruption in it uh, c from people misusing their gifts um, that you know it would turn the world into utter chaos basically I mean you know it's nice that what we're doing is letting people know yeah there is a different way that you can be and you can cause change yourself but in some ways I think it's good that not everyone is doing that because we would have some conflicts coming up uh, that would cause for some very strange uh, situations to happen well yeah everyone manipulating um, the attention and energy of others on a magical scale would not uh, not be conducive to the world we live in now however watered down versions of that are are seen everywhere. I mean, you know, if you look at one of the greatest magicians of the 20th century, it would have to be Walt Disney. Walt was the expert of putting people into trance states, showing them the right selection of images, producing the effect he wanted. In, in many cases, the effect of them giving him more money. But if you go to things like, or well, even the, the Haunted Palace in Disneyland, which opened in 1966, that's a magical working. It changes you. You know, you don't go far out thinking, ah, I know the spirit world exists. But what you do is you walk out thinking, damn, I want to do that right again. Yeah. And it will show up in your dreams. You tell other people about it. It has a magical effect. Now, a lot of people would say, well, that's just psychology. Well, what a terrible thing to say. Psychology, the, the science of the soul. Some aspects of magic are available for everyone, usually in a controlled fashion on them. Take a common magical talisman you'll probably find in your wallet. A little piece of linen with a um, pyramid on the back and some words in Latin. You're totally convinced that that is worth a dollar. Whereas in reality, of course, it's a linen rag. Right. And everyone else is convinced it's worth a dollar and will give you valuable things for it. Now, that's a piece of magic that is so fossilized, so dead, so part of the worldview now. People don't even understand that itself was also a magical action. That's true. And going back to, to Walt Disney for a second, because this is something that um, I've seen you do in the past. You know, you, you've spoken about someone who has done great things without considering themselves a magician. And you say, you know, as the magus so-and-so. Uh, yeah. And I think this is really interesting because it shows people that people can be doing magical work without labeling it as magical work. I mean, uh, obviously Walt Disney created the Magic Kingdom, so he had the little idea in there. And it definitely, I mean, when you walk through the gates and go there, you are in a whole different world. Um, so that's something that's really incredible. But uh, the fact that you are realizing people doing this work even though they don't call it magic I think is a, a very great thing to point out to us because it shows it shows us different ways that we can do this well you can look around you can find people in your own acquaintance that are just astoundingly lucky that no matter what they do it just things either work out well for them or if they work out badly in the short run it turns to be lucky in the long run. This is because of a magical talent. Now, some of the methods that magicians use, ritual, chant, symbolism, uh, or may not be the methods they use, or at least not the methods they are aware of. Yet, one of the things that has happened since certainly the coming of the Aeon Set is magic is often taught not as magic, but as corporate improvement. Mm -hmm. So you take people, you remove them from their corporate environment, put them in some liminal place, some cabin out in the woods, you teach them chants to say, you give them a magical obstacle to do, like a fire walking, and they come back and for two, two, three years, suddenly they're super employees. Now, if you said, this is initiation, these chants are mantras for you, 
this fire is symbolic of certain things, then people would shy away from it. But magic is returning without the medieval trappings. Right. And, and that's a good point to bring up is that, you know, we don't need a special magical room. There are, there are some of us who are lucky enough to have this space and, you know, there, I've known of two people that like had a, a room that they painted all black and they had a big circle painted on the floor. Not that we really need circles, but I mean, you can perform a magical ritual anywhere. You don't need to have your robe. You don't need to have your medallion. You don't need the candles. Um, it, it, we've discovered ways of doing it and found out that it works without the trappings. And I think that's a really big point. Well, and, and you know, again, anything that gives you access to your soul, access to your own potential, is going to be incredibly personal. And things that worked, or, or maybe didn't work, all we have is the copies of, obviously, text of old, may not be what works for you. A, a couple of examples. In the Temple of Set, there's a group called the Order of the Trapezoid, which I'm sure you have heard of. Oh, yes. Uh, the uh, OTR specializes in one of its areas of study, uses various forms of, um, uh, I guess you'd probably call it magica technica, in the use of very modern and ultra-modern equipment to create the same sort of moods. Now, some of that was begun uh, with its original founder, with Anton LaVey, who liked monster movie imagery, you know, sort of a vision of science that's appropriate for, I don't know, Victor Frankenstein. But we have people that are interested in cyber magic now. Um, I was just looking at a working that the Omega element is doing in the temple. And it required people to read up on current quantum theory, philosophies of time. So this is not, you know, the old, I'm going to draw the thing on the floor with the chalk and have some misspelled Hebrew and it's going to work. But if you like that, that works too. Right. Um, the order that uh, I am Grandmaster of, the order set by Kamalost, specializes in taking magic from late antiquity and putting it forth in a modern setting. And we have actually done workings at museums and sites completely in the open because we go in and say, we'd like to read some texts. And had people like be very respectful and quite taken by the mystery, which would be very good, uh, very much the way it would be done in late antiquity too. Yeah, that, rem um, that reminds me of okay. the ritual we did at the British Museum. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was, uh, you know, each of us found something within the museum that stuck with us. It, it caused a bit of change in us, and we all brought it back and shared it with each other. You know, and again, for museums, of course, the word itself means Temple of the Muses, are wonderful magical tools. And the British Museum particularly so, because so many cultures um, are represented in things the British Empire has stolen over the years. Well, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, well, not you know, it's, I'm, not, I'm not against imperialism when it works for me, but I, you know, I might have a different feeling if it was taken from me. Sure, that's understandable. I mean, I, I, that place was so huge, I don't think I actually got to see all of it um, during the time we had there. And uh, it, it was quite incredible to see all of the things that they had. And um, it, it was a very interesting working because I know for myself, something I took back from that when I was sharing it, uh, someone's face lit up. And for them, it was the same thing that they had found. And what <clears throat> what I was describing was exactly what they were thinking about it. And so we had this sort of connection and synchronicity that was going on at the time that, you know, I never expected to happen. And it, it's amazing. I mean, you can, you could say what we're doing right now is a ritual. I mean, 
we're preparing a show that is going to be available to anyone with a computer in the world and it may bring about change within them just listening to what we're talking about well it will definitely bring about change anytime magicians utter with intent that's a magical utterance Everything else you just do to simply make the delivery system better. Right. Uh, I, I saw a wonderful example of that years ago. Um, Dr. Flowers put together a series of lectures uh, that he sells from Luna Raven under the name of the Runer Mall, you know, voice of the rune. He decided to give these lectures and then to write them and publish them. He did not do any publicity. He told his roommate, so I'm going to start doing these. 10 o'clock in the morning, Sunday morning. Tell people if you want to come. First one, the roommate overslept. Then, you know, came in and Edward was halfway through the lecture. Just giving it to an empty room. Now, a non-magician would not even begin to understand that as a gesture. But a magician knows it's about intent. His roommate, Jim Chisholm, told four or five people in the room guild. About three weeks later, I was in a shopping mall, but the least magical place in America, when I saw a runer I knew from San Antonio saying, are you going to the lecture tomorrow? And I said, what lecture? I found out, I told local settings, by the time he finished the series, there were 50 people that came to the lectures, uh, high-ranking occultists, there were college professors, there were people that had never heard about magic and just thought it was neat, coming from up to four and five hours away to come. And that became utterly transformative for me. The transformation was in making the effort to go here as much as the message. Magic will find the right person to listen to it. The things you're doing, such as wonderful, wonderful show you put forward, helps a lot more people. But even if you just put this out there on one disc and hid it in a library, it would find its way to the right person. That right person is listening now and nodding their head. Mm -hmm. I can definitely see that because I know there are things that I've put out there. I uh, I was asked to do some voiceover work um, for a very large poem that was written by a former British Setian. And now that uh, CD is in the um i'm not sure what it's called but it's essentially the british uh national library uh and it's there that you know people can take it out and listen to it and hear the words of another and hopefully it'll bring about change in them so i thought that was kind of amazing because when i started to do it i wasn't really thinking that was where it was going to end up but um you know, it's uh, if you do something, you can cause the change to happen. Well, the the universe is always changing. We live you know, here in the, the world of becoming, in the world that we we're anchored in by our senses. Change is happening all the time, um, and some of it is good. A lot of it is really hard, and a lot of human life depends on deciding, do I want to be on the side of the good? And for Sedium, the word the good can almost always be changed to the intelligent. I wrote an article for Gnosis Magazine years ago on uh, Sedium ethics and pointed out again and again, our definition of the good largely simply means the intelligent. Human beings have what it takes to make a better world. Unfortunately, they also have all the things it takes to make a terrible world. Right. And we've seen and that... And the gods, humans... Good. Yeah, we've seen that happen in other countries um, with dictatorships that have formed, uh, you know, over time, the various dictatorships that have happened and the atrocities that they've caused. Um, but yet, you know, we do have people who do good also. So they're, they're usually doing something that they think is a good idea. And it usually, if it's an intelligent idea, will last over time. 
And that, uh, that is ultimately one of the ideas of Kefir, is that you are taking something, an idea, something existent only in your subjective universe, and you make it into something that exists in the objective universe. Um, you take the ideas of, of anyone, of Thomas Jefferson, who, you know, great, wonderful, Freemasonic thinker. His ideas have so outlived him. You know, people go back to, oh, he's a slave owner, or, you know, the questions you might have about his character. But ideas of creating a nation where you have a democracy of opportunity from which an aristocracy of achievement can arise, that's one of the greatest magical ideas ever made. And it's just because at the right time, the person with the right training said the right words. Yes. Yes, and I think that that was a very good example. Um, well, Don, I would like to thank you very much for being on the show. I'm going to add links to the show notes to your books for people who want to get them. And um, this has been a wonderful talk. Well, well, thank you so much for calling me, Robert. You've been listening to KHBR, The Voice of Darkness. If you have any questions or comments, you can email them to us at khpr at keffer.org. Thank you for listening, and we hope that we've been able to bring about some change for you. I'm fucking uh, Ozzy Osbourne, the Prince of fucking Darkness. Evil, evil, fuck, fucking evil. The only one, the Prince of Darkness. And that would be me, Robert Adams.